someone who does lots of work in 3D and in stereo uh, and is well known to all of us, Professor Dr. Andrew Woods, recently professored um, from, well, many institutions here, but from Curtin University in Western Australia. Um, and we've seen some of his underwater stereo photography and videos and reconstructions in the last few years. And I guess this is a new um, talk. New project. New project? Yes. Looking at legacy stereo photography. Um, okay, Andrew. You ready? Thank you, Nick. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this project, Patrick Baker from the WA Museum, or uh, recently retired from the WA Museum, Trevor Winton from Flinders University, Daniel Adams from Curtin. Um, and uh, this is some recently uh, conducted work relating to a wreck of a ship that was lost in 1841 off the coast of Western Australia. Um, just south of Perth, south of Fremantle. Um, it was called the James Matthews. It was a former slave ship. Um, the design it used was known as a snow brig, which is the, uh, um, the drawing you can see on the right-hand side there. And um, it was discovered by um, a, a group of, um, oh, sorry. Oh, I must have played the wrong one. Um, it was discovered by a group of uh, amateur um, um, underwater explorers and divers um, in 1973, um, um, like I said, five kilometres south of, of Fremantle, and it's uh, you know very close to shore. And um, you know, there's there's the uh, oops, sorry, let me put that on the right screen. It's very uh, um, close to shore and uh, um, in very shallow water as well. So. Um, after it was discovered um, in the period from 1973 to 1977, a, a wide range, a, a selection of excavations and expeditions were carried out at the site to, uh, to photograph, um, explore and um, characterise the, the location. So that included staff from the Maritime Archaeology Department of the Western Australian Museum, which was um, just recently established in the early 1970s. Um, primarily on, uh, to um, investigate some of the other wrecks that have been discovered along the West Australian coast. Um, and so the museum staff and also volunteers carried out four seasons of excavation of the wreck. Um, the f site was extensively photographed and um, um, this is in the days of 35 millimetre photography you're actually putting a roll of film in the camera and it moves past and you have a maximum of 36 photographs per roll of film and then you have to take it up to the surface, dry off the camera and swap out the film. Um, and uh, they also used a, a highly structured approach to ensure that they um, um, got very good overlapping photography and, and made sure that they actually had um, full coverage of the site as they excavated and uncovered it. Um, so they installed a range of, um, as we can see in the next photograph, next image, a series of rails. Where's my mouse gone? There it is. A series of rails and then a photo tower, which um, then they'd have their camera or cameras um, situated upon. So um, throughout those years, they collected 1,652 photographs. Um, which is absolutely phenomenal given that you had a maximum of 36 photographs per roll of film. Um, and they used a, a, a relatively new camera at that stage called a Nikonos, um, with, uh, it was a specific underwater uh, film camera. Um, the primary purpose of <coughs> taking all those overlapping photographs was to generate a two-dimensional photo mosaic. Um, and that was generated at the time by printing the photographs, slicing them together and then joining them together to create sort of a composite view of, of the site. The difficulty underwater is that you often don't have very good um, visibility, especially in this shallow location, you, you, you did, they didn't, and therefore you can't just go back and take a wide angle photograph. Um, so it usually needs to be lots of individual photographs fairly close up that then you could 
join together. So we can see two runs here. So they've got the two rails and then they've photographed this section. And under here will be the, uh, the hull and then various bits and pieces that were in the boat when it sank. Uh, the second row here, you can see some uh, ballast stones, and uh, I'll explain some of the items a little bit later. But the problem with a photo mosaic is that it assumes the site is flat, which it is not, and therefore there's going to be all sorts of parallax errors in that reconstructed image. Um, and hence, fundamentally, your um, result is distorted. Um, from that, they also did, um, and, and other information, they also produced a, uh, a site diagram, more of an artistic um, interpretation of, of all those things being added together, um, also including the field notes. And uh, so that, that's one thing that allows them to gain a better understanding of the site. But again, it's subject to a lot of interpretation and error and uh, misinterpretation due to those errors. Now, what we've been doing a lot of work on recently is processing um, image collections that um, um, are of the same site, and that allows us to generate 3D models of the site. So it's a technique um, called photogrammetric 3D reconstruction, or sim sometimes simply just photogrammetry. And it's a very capable approach, and, and uh, um, it produces, it can produce some very realistic and uh, um, accurate results. But it does need lots of overlapping photography to be able to generate those digital 3D models. And in the case of a legacy site, such as this, all the photography was done in the 1970s, it's touch and go as to whether that amount of overlap was, was available at the time. This one, fortunately, um, was highly structured in the, in the uh, approach that was used and um, as a result we have had some good results. Um, this particular photograph here shows some slate tiles which, which were brought from um, the UK to be used as uh, roofing tiles and then here's some of the, uh, um, the, again, the ballast stones. So in the case of legacy photography you can't go back, it's what you have. With newly um, uh, photographed sites, you have the opportunity to um, photograph the site more extensively with the intent of using this technique. So this is a 3D model we generated of a wreck of Australia's first submarine that was lost in 1941 off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And uh, we collected 8,000 images of that particular wreck. The wreck is 55 metres long, sitting in around 300 metres of water, and that um, was used to produce a very detailed 3D model. But we collected all of that photography with the intent of generating a 3D model. Here's another um, example. Um, in 2015, we surveyed the wrecks of HMA Sydney 2 and the German vessel HSK Cormoran. If you saw the, if you're here for the 3D theatre last night, you saw some of the 3D video from those wreck sites. On that expedition, we collected 500,000 images, and we are gradually going through and processing those to generate de detailed digital 3D models of those wreck sites. So both the wrecks and also their extensive debris fields. Um, so the point being is, if it's a newly captured site. You, you've got a lot more control over what, you've, what images you've got. But with a legacy site, it is what it is. Um, and hopefully, there will be enough um, coverage. So, obviously, it's, we can't guarantee what was photographed in the past, and it's entirely dependent upon how the site was originally photographed. Someone wants to keep on coming in. Um, it also it depends upon how many photographs were taken, the, how much overlap of the photographs there was, the complexity of the site, and other factors. So on the left-hand side is a model of the wreck of a Dutch ship that wrecked off the West Australian coast in 1629. 
That was photographed in the 1970s, and around 3,500 photographs were taken of that site. And this is a 3D model of the transom area. So if, we can, uh, if I can quickly um, illustrate this. So this is the, the, the side of the hull, and then this is the, the back of the ship, or the, the transom area, just up here. Um, I'm just showing it in 2D here, but given it's a 3D model, we can also render it out in stereoscopic 3D as well, or view it in VR and a range of other opportunities. On the right-hand side is a Spanish ship that sank off the coast of Afri Africa in 1629, sorry, 1697. Um, 570 photographs were taken of that in the, about the 1970s as well. The 1970s were a very active period of maritime archaeology and a lot of data sets are just waiting for being processed. So you can see here that the, the quality of the 3D model here is, is very good as well. And again, that comes back to the very structured approach that the team who collected those images followed. All right, so back to the, the James Matthews. We've got two areas where we've particularly focused on at the moment to generate 3D models uh, from that original stereo photography. Um, this is what's called row 10, and um, as you can probably guess, there were multiple rows that were um, f photographs were captured of, uh, and this row had quite a number of these slate tiles. Uh, you can see the timbers of the bottom of the hull here. Oops. And also you can see some of the, um, the ballast stones. Um, these rails here, oops, where are we? These rails here were um, installed to give structure to the, um, uh, the positions of the photography. And uh, um, we have to go in and, and mask those out individually, otherwise they start to affect the, uh, the results of the processing. Um, the second area is the Keelson. Uh, this particular block here is called the, the, um, the mast step. It's the, the base of the mast, what the mast sits in at the base of the ship. And um, um, I'll show you the results of that in a, in a few moments. So there are a number of challenges working with this particularly, particular data set. Um, most of the photography was downward looking. Um, and as a result, um, um, as I'll show you in a few moments, the, the, there are some impacts of, of, of that. Um, there is a lot of sand across the site, and sand can be a very um, good feature, and so that could affect the quality of the reconstruction. Um, in this particular example, the advantages we had was that the photography was extensive and structured using the photo tower and rails, and it was specifically collected also with the intent of um, using it for stereoscopic photography, both viewing and also subsequent processing. So we had that advantage in that they were using overlapping photography because of that. This is the photo tower in 3D, um, and um, uh, you can see the rails sitting above the hull there, and you can see the, the, the hull-shaped curved shape there. So this section shows um, um, just part of the, um, just the, the cargo, I suppose, um, again in row 10. And uh, um, we can see the, uh, uh, the, the pieces of slate, which again were being brought from England to build um, uh, big build houses, build um, build the, uh, the, the, the roof, um, and you can also see the, uh, um, uh, the wooden timbers of the hull underneath as well. Most of the photography taken on the site was uh, black and white, but there were a few colour pairs taken as well. Again, this, would, this might have been just a handheld pair, um, and uh, this just shows one of the um, particular items on the site. I, I forget what this particular um, item was, but uh, they've also got a... Um, um, sort of a, a, a calibrated cube there to try and provide scale. It looks quite distorted, so uh, um, again, probably because it was um, handheld, it's not being shown orthostereoscopically, so this is a good example of some of the papers that have been discussed, um, on, particularly on Monday. 
Um, so these are some, uh, some renders, animated renders of some of the, um, the 3D models that we've generated. This one's row 10. And again, you can see the, uh, the ballast stones. And over here, you can see some of the slate. Now, if I'd been much more conscientious, I could have generated this in stereoscopic 3D as well, but uh, lazy me didn't get around to it in time. And uh, here is um, the keel scenario with the mast step. And uh, now you can start to see the limitation of it all being downward looking photography. And we have some gaps here in the 3D model, particularly along vertical edges. So uh, that uh, um, is just a, a limitation of how the photography was taken. Again, if you are going to be doing that now with the intent of generating these 3D models, then you'd get some oblique photography as well as the top down. All right, so in conclusion, um, the processing has been, been working very well so far. We've only um, processed a part of the site. Um, the plan is to repeat the processing across further rows and then join the rows together to produce a, uh, um, hopefully, a very accurate 3D model of the entire hull. Um, to do that, we need to take all of the images for each row, uh, mask out the rails and any other non-rec features that have uh, been captured in the images, and then we need to process them. And uh, we've also got the opportunity to um, uh, process some, um, in the future, process some other um, legacy wrecked data sets of the, which the museum has, has quite, quite a lot. Um, and uh, one that we're working on at the moment is a wreck um, in, uh, I think it's actually off the coast of Cyprus that sank in approximately 288 BC. So um, it's just amazing to be able to access some of these data sets and, and produce some amazing results from them. So with that, thank you very much.